BBC Sherlock, in my opinion, is one of the most underrated shows ever created. It gets a lot of heat for having quite an annoying fanbase stemming from the Tumblr days, but personally it's my favorite show ever created and has some of the best writing that I've ever seen in cinema. But today we're going to look past possibly the most revered aspect of the show, the writing, and dive into a part of the show that probably not many people even notice. The sound design of BBC Sherlock is probably one of the best examples of simple sound design done to perfection. Nothing over the top, nothing too fancy, just some good old fashioned simplicity. The reason it flies under the radar is for that reason exactly. It doesn't have that wow factor that a lot of other TV shows and movies have, and it isn't overly complicated, but I think that's the point. In an overly complex and complicated world, there are so many variables and moving pieces to the show already. When creating a film or TV show, you need to be conscious of how much data is too much for your viewer to ingest at once. Between all of the overly complicated factors within this show, it would simply be too much to add yet another aspect of complexity to each scene by overexerting the sound design. But don't confuse simplicity with mediocrity. Let's dive into why the simplicity of Sherlock's sound design might be so intriguing to a viewer like myself and how it helps drive the story. I've broken down the way sound design in Sherlock is used into three main categories. To accentuate the scene or make it feel larger than life, to aid the viewer with context, and as a metaphor or analogy. And this ties back into my original statement. Nothing is overly complex about these three categories, they've all been done before, but it's how and when the writers choose to use sound in such a simple way that really is intriguing. Accentuating things with sound design is usually the goal of cinema. That's why, a lot of the time, the objects used to create certain sounds aren't always the same ones that we're seeing on screen. Accentuating certain sounds gives a feeling of things being larger than life, and that's what cinema is about. An immersive experience that feels real enough, but overall seems greater than the world we live in. This shot of John Watson waking up from a drunken slumber in a prison cell is one of my favorite uses of this concept. John's eyelids opening and closing almost sound like dragon's wings flapping in the air. The bold, booming sound brings attention to one specific thing, his eyes opening and closing, because, as hungover as John is, the tiniest little sounds can practically be heard inside of his own head. Simple things like the exaggerated sound of a laser. What would you like me to make him say next? or the booming bass hits when punching in a passcode. This is your heart, and you should never let it rule your head. Would simply not have the same jarring effect if the point of the sound design was realism. Take this shot of the laser, for example. Typically, laser pointers don't make noise, in my own experience, but there needs to be a certain aspect of excitement and an alert to the viewer that shit's about to go down. Here's the shot without the sound effect added. What would you like me to make him say Next. And with the sound effect. What would you like me to make him say next? The same goes for the scene when Sherlock has finally beaten Irene Adler, the rival of the episode A Scandal in Belgravia, in a game of wits, as he punches in the passcode to unlock her phone that's riddled with dark secrets that she uses for blackmail. We hear these booming bass sounds with each keystroke as her life seems to crash before her eyes. Measurements, but this, this is far more intimate. This is your heart, and you should never let it rule your head. You could have chosen any random number and walked out of here today with everything you've worked for. But you just couldn't resist it, could you? I've always assumed that love is a dangerous disadvantage. Thank you for the final proof. Without these bass hits, there isn't as much drama. It takes away the feeling that Sherlock has literal power generating through his thumbs, and can possibly even be seen as a metaphor for the power he has over Irene Adler by knowing her passcode. I was just playing the game. I know. And this is just losing. Now, using sound to aid the viewer with context is one of Sherlock's strongest assets. There are so many complexities in this show, constantly confusing the viewer and throwing a million things at your eyes and brain at one time. That's why using sound for context is important. If we just see five things quickly appear on screen in succession, it would be slightly difficult to remember all of what you just saw. But if you get both a visual and an audible cue, 
you've now been given two forms of context instead of just one, leading to a better chance of remembering what was on screen. We see this a lot in scenes where Sherlock uses his deduction powers. This specific scene is a great example, as it gives context to almost every piece of information being deduced by Sherlock. Please, Mr. Holmes, where you're going, you'll want to be dressed. The sound of the cash register while showing the man's $700 suit. The sound of dogs barking while we see fur on the man's clothes. Everything is mapped out to give audible context to what's trying to be communicated. The same goes for this shot in episode 1 of season 4, The Six Thatchers. Sherlock and John had just been to a crime scene in which a bust of Margaret Thatcher had been smashed on the ground. A few scenes later, Sherlock realizes that there had been yet another break-in, and another broken bust of Margaret Thatcher, where the sound of breaking clay is heard as they show an overlay on half of Sherlock's face of the bust breaking. Uh, different part of town. You were right, this is, this is a thing, something's going on. Another great use of sound for context is when Sherlock dives into his mind palace during a scene in the episode The Hounds of Baskerville. As Sherlock goes into his mind palace, his own version of the hard drive inside his mind where he stores all of his important information, he quickly swipes through numerous items that are stored in his mental iCloud, wiping each one away as quickly as it enters his brain. As we see each thing he's thinking about visually, we're also met with a sound to go with it. Again, this gives so much context, doubling the amount of sensory information the viewer is receiving, by not only seeing the item, but hearing it as well. And this is why the use of sound for context is so helpful in such a complex world. Ah! Uh, no, that wasn't... No, I, I it didn't... Was me. And finally, the use of sound as a metaphor. Whether it's the sound of Moriarty, the show's main antagonist, barking like a psychotic dog, conveying that he's so mentally insane that he should be kept on a leash. Or the sound of roller coaster tracks in this vision that Sherlock has of himself being pulled out of the morgue just after he'd been shot in real life, conveying that he's in for a roller coaster of an experience. What's happening? <laughs> going into shock is the next thing that's going to kill you. The writers obviously used sound design very intentionally to portray certain metaphors and analogies depending on what's being seen on screen. However, my favorite use of analogy through sound design is the way that classical music is used during chaotic scenarios on more than one occasion. Here we see Moriarty breaking into the Tower of London to steal the crown jewels. As chaotic as this might be, there's an elegance to the way that Moriarty is so calm, even though what he's doing is absolutely insane. Not only that, but the classical song choice of La Gaza Ladra is what's playing in the background, translated to The Thieving Magpie. So there's been a break in. The same goes for this shot where, unknown to the viewer at the time, Mrs. Hudson, Sherlock's landlady, is driving what appears to be 50 plus miles per hour over the speed limit while being chased by cops. As ridiculous as the scenario is, a classical piece is playing over top of the scene. The main analogy that we see being used here is that, although the scenario is obviously chaotic in nature, the swift drifting of the luxury Aston Martin that Mrs. Hudson is driving is so eloquent that it's almost like she's just out for a day drive. Want to introduce me? And a few minutes later into the episode, we see again another use of classical music being used to convey a sense of eloquence inside of an otherwise chaotic scenario. As Sherlock is high as a kite on what we assume is heroin, gun in hand, flailing it all around the room like a lunatic, his unbelievable brain is still able to recite the words to the famous speech, Once More Unto the Breach, Dear Friends, by William Shakespeare. Yeoman, whose limbs were made in England, show us here the metal of your pasture. So I doubt not, for there is none of you here so mean and base that hath not noble luster in your eyes. High on heroin, gun out and about, aiming to shoot the wall, flailing around like a madman, the orchestra plays still, and conveys the image of poise in a place of chaos. The game's a foot. 
Oh, hello. Can I have a cup of tea? And these three main categories brought together throughout the series are what make the sound design in this show so special. A beautiful concoction of simplicity to perfection. Not too much, not too little, just a brilliant use of simplicity in an otherwise complicated world.